to mediate and prevent mining conflicts. It's not really a theory that I will expose. Uh, it's more or less uh, a, a few questions. It's, it's like a hypothesis. Uh, it's like uh, something I want to uh, talk about with you. It is, um, although the, the, the actual vision um, of Katapa and the way in which we uh, are dealing with our uh, partners in the South. And, uh, but I think it's, it's open for discussion and um, specifically also within Katapa we are like trying to uh, uh, renew our vision um, to work together with, with the partners we have in the South. I first will like give a short introduction. Uh, I know that most of you will know uh, most of the things that I will say but it's just a bit a brief context of um, the concrete uh, issues we, are, we will talk about, about the, the specific characteristics of the conflicts, the mining conflicts that we can see today. Um, first of all, we use a lot of metals and minerals. We often don't think about it. And we use that much, and it's increasing that much, the use of metals, the use of energy, that we are dealing at the moment uh, moment of, let's say, scarcity, a moment of um, feeling and no, um, that it's impossible to exploit in a limited way the non-renewable resources. It will be our generation that will be confronted with the limits, with borders of planet Earth. And it's specifically on all the non-renewable resources it will be uh, uh, the biggest challenge, I think, for, for our generation um, to think about how can we, in a sustainable way, which is in fact impossible, how can we deal with um, those scarce uh, resources. So there's a growing population, growing energy consumption, growing material consumption, and there's only one planet. <coughs> And we see that companies right now are entering in competition to gain access to the last reserves of natural resources. And specifically on metals and minerals and uh, oil and gas, we can see that it's like more clear uh, than in other sectors uh, because the simple fact that they're like non-renewable. If we check out the scarcity, and this is um, if we stay on growing our consumption at the same rate with, that uh, we have now in the United States, which is, which is very high, but still it's, it's uh, uh, a possibility, let's say, that we still have, like, to say something, 19 years of uranium, etc., and uh, only 40 years left for chromium or gold. There are several studies uh, stating this. I just show you quickly the graphics, and I will off. I, I can imagine that afterwards you can uh, check it in detail if you want. And they're very scarce minerals and metals, as we know. Um, and the effect of that is that, of course, prices are increasing also. 
which also is a factor that like um, enforces or uh, the the mining boom, and the same is happening with the, the oil industry. I'm just going to the the consequences of this uh, boom, um, and right here I call it like sort of anxiety um, that we can notice uh, with the big bigger corporations. They want to exploit or access all the natural resources as fast as possible because they know very well that within 10 years or 20 years it will be much uh, more expensive to exploit them. If ecological crisis is going on and it will go on, if ecological crisis means that there will be more legislation at an international level, more um, control mechanisms, etc then probably costs will uh, increase and so they want to do it right now. Right now also when there are lots of weak states or failing states that um, don't have good uh, um, uh, legal frameworks um, and uh, functioning uh, judicial systems. So it's right now um, the economic opportunity and it's of strategic importance uh, to do it right now. And this is leading to what we call, and what maybe um, recently it's like a sort of common uh, uh, term, uh, is the second colonization, a sort of uh, new uh, colonization of Latin America in, in this case. Um, and this has an, a huge impact on peasant communities it causes less options for development and sovereignty for them and it causes a lot of injustice and ecological and social debt. I just want to uh, show you, and we already saw a few maps of Peru, uh, but just to show the, the mining boom, or let's say the boom of extractive industries, because in this map you can see the concessions for gas and petroleum which are like the, the orange and green blocks. Check out what, what is happening in the, the next years. This is the 2004 um, map, September 2005, 2005 December, 2006, 2007, 2009, when like 74% of the Amazon basin um, has concessions of oil and gas um, and at this moment it's about 19 percent point eight four something. No, no, this is a map of, uh, this is an old map. This is an old map. Yeah, this is yeah. an old map. So it's now it's already more, 19 yeah, yeah, percent? No, it's over 20 percent. Over 20 percent yeah. already of mining concessions in, uh, in, in Peru, in the Andes. So it's a quite a new phenomenon. Uh, we also saw uh, the presentation of Hido where there is uh, the situation of Cacamarca. Like in 1990, it was 0.2% of the national territory. Right now, it's over 20%. You can understand that this is causing lots of conflicts. Well, you, you can see the data, 20.3%. It's incredible. It's more than 50% of the local communities have mining concessions uh, on their territory. Below their feet. Sorry? Below their feet. Eh? Below their feet, indeed. And if we see the overlap, let's say, of, um, of the use of, uh, of the country, of the land, you can see that mining concessions, gas and petroleum concessions, um, and this is forestry, and also uh, fishery, fishery concessions, they're like um, overlapping with lots of territoria of um, indigenous communities, and also overlapping with natural uh, or nature resources. And in that sense, and if we all know that more than 50% uh, of the local communities are part of the, the um, economically active population in Peru is still living off agriculture, we know that this can only cause lots of conflicts. And that's what we can see um, indeed going on in, uh, in Peru specifically where uh, the Unidad de Conflictos 
uh, is monitoring every year um, how much conflicts they can see in the country. 48% uh, of the conflicts appear to be social e ecological conflicts, and 68% of them are mining conflicts. This is like 11% uh, about petroleum and gas, and it will increase soon, I think. Um, so there are lots of conflicts. Who has to do? Who have to do with? Um, the access to water, the access to uh, land for uh, peasant communities in, uh, in Latin America as a whole. Um, what we see and what we can notice is clearly that there are like different discourses um, between the, let's say, the actors that give the concessions and that uh, ask for the concessions and the actors who are living on the same territory. Different discourses, um, for them often, for instance, uh, the land is like sacred, can be a, can have a sort of spiritual um, meaning, and uh, territory for them is not the same as, as we can, or we might reflect on territory from an economic or legal perspective or a scientific perspective. 